right. Hey, man, it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. I'm grateful that you're here with us this evening. Let's go ahead and take out our Bibles tonight and open with me, if you would, please, to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 26. And let's go over our memory verse for this month, Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4, Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. And uh, we'll do it like we normally do. We'll say it a couple of times with, uh, with the help of the Bible. And then as best you can, try to do it from memory on that third go around. Isaiah 26 and verse number 3. Let's read it together. Ready? Begin. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. He trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord. And the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. I don't know if you ever do this or not, but sometimes when I read, uh, I kind of get ahead of myself and then don't know if I read what I just read correctly, and I pause there and then got all lost. Well, praise the Lord. Um, uh, you, you, never, you never have any mistakes, do you? Okay, good, good, amen. Just me, I help you, help you feel better then. All right, let's try it again. Ready, begin. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. All right, let's say it one last time. Try to do it from memory if you're able to. Ready, begin. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. All right, I'm going to get that thing. Praise God. All right. We have uh, some letters from the missionaries. And as I said last time, it seems like we're having a hard time getting caught up with all of the activities and things that are going on and setbacks that we've had. And uh, so we haven't been able to read them on a weekly basis like we normally do. And so I read a number of them today. And uh, so I think I'm... Uh, Hopefully, I'll get all these right, and, uh, but, um, but I have some other missionaries in my mind, two things that I've read, so I'll try to remember these as, as I look at the highlights that I made on these. But the Morales family in, in, in Israel uh, have written us and uh, talking about some of the things that they've been doing, uh, were doing during the Feast of, the, of Weeks, uh, the, the Feast of Pentecost, and they talked about some of the trouble that they're having in the church, and so they're calling it the, the First Fruits of Trouble, which is an interesting way to, to title it. We have one couple who is uh, headed for divorce without the Lord getting involved uh, in both of their hearts. And so pray about that, if you would, please. Uh, that's always a heartbreak when, when there's um, uh, a division in the home. And, uh, and so pray about that, that they might find some harmony and some answers and some encouragement in their home life. Then also we've had one family who already left once and returned uh, with tears of repentance and so they, they were there and left and then came back, and now suddenly they're, they're gone again. And so pray about that. Uh, pray that whatever the issues may be, they'll be able to work through those with that dear family as well. And then also some more trouble that they're uh, dealing with is, is attention uh, from the neighborhood and, and what they're doing religiously. And, and so uh, just pray about that, that none of that becomes an issue for them. Uh, so they've got some folks in their neighborhood that are uh, questioning folks that are coming to their house to meet for their main service, and uh, just keep that before the Lord in prayer. However, they are con continuing to reach out, are ministering in, the, in a Muslim town that uh, we talked about the last time, uh, a, a man by the name of Allah and his family. Uh, the, their meeting with them is producing some good results. He asked me if I would teach... Uh, if I, would, if I would teach him and his mother uh, theology from a non-Catholic or Orthodox point of view. And so they're grateful to be able to do that. Uh, now, they have the idea of being able to reach out to other people, but uh, their idea, of course, is to spread the gospel. So pray about that, if you would, please. Each year, all the sixth graders in our town go up to Jerusalem uh, for a special ceremony at the, West, uh, at the Western Wall. They receive an Old Testament while they're there. Last year, as a result of them going uh, their daughter befriended a, a little girl by, by the name of Nilly, and that opened the door for them to be able to witness to that, that young girl's family. And that witness is ongoing. It's taking some time, and, and they're still working through that. But this year, she went uh, again on the trip, received her Old Testament, and met another young girl. 
and um, they're praying that that will produce the same kind of fruit and be able to get into that family as well. So pray about that if you would, please. Then also five students will begin their training in the Jezreel Valley Bible Institute. And so grateful uh, that they're able to get that up and running. Pray for that if you would, please, as they're learning the Word of God and how to understand the Word of God and then, and then through understanding the Word of God to be able to faithfully communicate it, preach it, and teach it. Uh, the Thomases in India uh, have written us as well. Uh, they, uh, you may recall, last time we were able to to give some reports. We uh, we gave the report from the Unruhs, and they had mentioned Brother Thomas being there with them. And here in their update, they mentioned the same thing. Pastor and Mrs. Terry Unruh uh, invited them to come to the Mount uh, to Mount Lavinia for their missions conference, and so they mentioned what a blessing that was, and to see the work that God is doing. Uh, in the ministry there in Sri Lanka. Uh, but another reason to highlight this is the if you know anything about the, the recent political unrest in Sri Lanka, uh, boy, they sure do need some of our prayers. Uh, so pray about that situation, if you would, please, with the, uh, the whole prime minister, I guess. And, and uh, I don't know how, how far-ranging it is, but some of his folks uh, in, in the cabinet, uh, as well as I understand, are stepping down and and getting out of Dodge, well, the getting is good, and so pray about that if you would, please. And just some of the unrest, the political unrest that is there. But then also he talks about their summer outreaches, how they went well. Uh, they were able to organize some house-to-house -house visitation and distribution. Uh, also some open-air meetings um, and other evangelistic meetings as well. And then also he mentions that all of this was done in states uh, that uh, are somewhat hostile to the to Christians and to uh, the Christian ministries. And so continue to pray about that, if you would, please. It seems like in some of those states, things are really closing down quickly. We've talked about that in previous updates, but uh, pray that God would protect them. And he does uh, thank God in this uh, letter for God's protection from harm. Uh, as you know, India is closing, uh, is closed to foreign missionaries in many uh, restrictions are being enforced on nationals as well, and so they're losing some of their liberty. Keep that in prayer, if you would, please. Um, he goes on to say that they've also been praying for new doors to open and starting a new Bible Institute in the Northeast region. Pray about that, that God would direct and move there as well. And then also from all of this, he says, 28 souls came to know Christ as their Savior and more than 20 people uh, dedicated their lives as well. So praise the Lord for ongoing work there in India. Uh, the Winklers in Croatia, uh, they were on a uh, brief deputation, but they're back in, in uh, Croatia now. And uh, in January of this year, uh, the brother that he's been working with there has decided that the Lord is leading him to go down to another city and start another church. And so for the three years that they've been there working with Brother Leslie have been a, uh, uh, an encouragement to them and have helped them uh, to get acclimated to Croatia and to the language there. But it's only been three years, and now he's leaving and turning the work over to uh, Brother Winkler. And so uh, he does believe it is God's will, but uh, is, is uh, certainly uh, a big step of faith for him uh, to, to take all of this over. So pray about that, if you would, please. The transition of leadership has already taken place. Uh, but it is, again, a large step of, of, faith, uh, of faith, praying that God will do great and mighty things. Then also, they mentioned that um, uh, the new church down in Split, where um, Brother Leslie is going to go, they're, they're reaching out with some uh, evangelistic outreach. Please pray that the people will come to the meeting, pray for people to be saved, and pray for the Leslies as they endeavor to start a church in Croatia's second largest city, uh, and then also some needs that they have locally. I pray about some of that as well as they're trying to spruce things up and do things right for the Lord. The Salmons in Bangkok have written us as well. And so this is the young Salmons. Pray for them as they get started on their new uh, church adventure with uh, Ben Tai, a Baptist church. And when they opened that church, they right afterwards, a month afterwards, they hosted their first outreach, was a, which was a uh, free four-week English course for kids uh, held at 9.30 on Sunday morning. And so they're targeting that time to hopefully uh, encourage them to stay through the service afterwards. And so uh, they had good success in getting people registered. Uh, the registration filled up quickly. And when the first week came, we were hoping that maybe just one of the kids and his family would stay afterwards for the church service. But to our surprise and excitement, 
All of the children who came for their English classes stayed uh, for services, as well as their parent or grandparent, whoever it was that brought them, stayed as well. And uh, they did that for the three weeks following as well. They all stayed. And so praise God for the contacts that that has made. At this point, no one has been saved from that, uh, but uh, pray that uh, God would continue to work in that area. They're also trying a second outreach, another four-week outreach uh, for a, a do-it-yourself kind of course. And so pray about that, if you would, please, uh, that they would have gr good fruit from that as well. Um, Katie has started uh, teaching solely in Thai as well, and so he mentions that quickly. I'd like to bring that to your attention. Pray for that. It's a real milestone, he says, in her language uh, development and learning and uh, a personal step of faith for her as well. So pray for her as she continues to minister uh, solely in, in the Thai language. And uh, then also, in particular, he mentions that uh, when we launched the new church, an unsaved friend of mine unexpectedly began attending our services and asking really great questions. She devoured the Gospel of John that we gave her and continued to come to our house to talk about God. While sitting around our dinner table last week, she told us that she had put her faith and trust in Christ. And so praise the Lord for that. There's a first fruit, if you will, of their new ministry. We are so thankful to see this first salvation uh, of the ministry of Bentai Baptist Church. And so continue to keep them in your prayers, if you would. Time now for us to lift our voice in song. So what's the song number? 116, as we stand together, let's sing out uh, for the glory of our Savior tonight. 116. Praise the Lord, he's still in charge, amen. 116, this is my father's world. We'll sing the first and the last. 116. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, my rest me in the thorns of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, and the wonders wrought. On the last. This is my Father's world. for that day when earth and heaven will be one 109 one of my personal favorites great is his faithfulness to us we'll sing the first and the last great is life
Chick-fil-A, man. Please remain standing. All right, if you would please take out your Bibles tonight and let's open to the book of Revelation. We have completed our study through the book of Daniel and we're starting a new series tonight in the book of Revelation as we go verse by verse through the book of Revelation. And I think probably the best place to start is right in verse 1 of chapter 1. So let's open up there tonight. We'll read the first three verses of the book of Revelation, ask God for his blessing, and get into our study this evening. I haven't said it yet, but if you're happy to be in the Lord's house, say amen. 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 It's good to be with you tonight. Let's take a look here. The book of the Revelation, chapter number one, in verse one, the Bible says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we come before your throne tonight, Lord, I pray that you'd please move and work on our behalf as only you can. Lord, we need to hear from you. We need your words. Even as we see here in the book of Revelation that you've told us, Lord, that blessed is the man that uh, doth read and hear and, uh, and apply to keep these things And Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight to have that that kind of heart, Lord, to understand who you are, to know you better, to love you more, to be able to better, uh, Lord, communicate your word and your truth to to the people around us, to the people that we love, the people that we know, and the people that we come into contact with. Lord, encourage us tonight. Help us to grow, not only in our faith, but also in our knowledge. And Lord, increase us, Father, in our walk with you. And Lord, we care for to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. You've heard people use the word apocalypse. They might say something like this. These are events of apocalyptic proportions. You've heard people say something like that. Or maybe they'll say that this is apocalyptic literature, you know, real wrath of God stuff. Or, you, or they might talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Surely you've heard about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The word itself, apocalypse, has come to mean that which is chaotic or associated with catastrophic destruction. In fact, apocalypse is most often used when someone is talking about or describing the end of the world. This is the end of the world. This is an apocalyptic time. We are at the end of times. This, however, is not the true meaning of the word. Apocalypse is a Greek word that means a revealing or unveiling. Stated simply, the word means revelation. Apocalypse is is Greek for revelation. The book of Revelation is the book of Apocalypse. Accordingly, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are the four horsemen of Revelation. However, it doesn't sound quite so menacing to say it that way. And so nobody ever says it that way. Nobody calls it the four horsemen of the Revelation or of Revelation. But it's the same thing. The words mean the same thing. The book of Revelation is an unveiling of the plan of God both in our current day and in the days to come. Look with me, if you would, please, at verse number one. The Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy these things that are going to come to pass, and then also in the here and now, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So it is an unveiling of the plan of God, 
of future things, but also of our current day. And we'll really find that to be true, especially in the first three chapters, more specifically in chapters two and three of the book of Revelation. It is also the last book of God's Word, both in order and in, chrono and in chronology. It is God's final Word through which He reveals Himself until His final revelation at His coming. Revelation was written by the Apostle John near the end of his life in approximately 95 A.D. while ex exiled to the island of Patmos under the rule of the Roman emperor Domitian. Look down at verse number 9. I, John, so now we know who the writer is. It is John the Apostle. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and impatience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is at Pat, called Patmos. And so he'd been exiled there, again under the rule of the emperor Domitian. Now, as God's final word, this book is extremely important and clearly indicated to be so in verse number three, where the Bible says, Blessed is he that readeth, and blessed are they that hear the words of the prophecy, and blessed are they that keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So this is an extremely important book for us to study. Nevertheless, many people are drawn to Revelation and fascinated by it, not because of its importance, not because there's a blessing involved, but rather because of its grand scope and captivating word pictures that we find throughout the book of Revelation. For instance, we've already mentioned the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and you hear about that, and you're kind of drawn to that. What in the world is that all about? But there are also seven seals and seven trumpets and seven vials. What are these groups of seven all about? What do they represent, and what do they mean? There are also 144,000 sealed Israelites. And who are they? And what is that all about? There is a star called Wormwood that we find in Revelation Chapter number six, what is that all about? Not chapter number six, but in chapter number eight. What is that all about? And where does that come from? There are locust-like angelic creatures coming out of the bottomless pit. Locust-like angelic creatures coming out of a pit that has no bottom. What in the world is that all about? There are two unnamed witnesses, and the Bible says that fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Another interesting image that we find in the book of Revelation. There's a woman, the Bible says, that is clothed with the sun. What does it mean for a woman to be clothed with the sun? Another very interesting word picture that we find in the book of the Revelation. There's also a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. There's also a beast that comes out of the sea that has seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns. There's another beast that comes out of the earth having two horns like that of a lamb. What in the world is this all about? What is this picturing? There's a, a red dragon. There's a beast. There's a, another beast, a beast that comes out of the sea, a beast that comes out of the earth. Very interesting. Very kind of just draw. It's fascinating to think about. There's also, of course, the great battle of Armageddon. And along with many, many other difficult and challenging passages that we can't go through here in one night. One consequence of all the many passages of Revelation that are admittedly difficult, one consequence of that is the fact that there are many and varied interpretations given for these things. Now, we're not going to travel into the wilderness of all the assorted interpretations that are out there. Someone say amen. Instead, we'll make an observation tonight that there are really only two methods for interpreting Revelation. Now, there are many interpretations that fall out of these two methods, but there are really only two methods for interpreting Revelation, as well as the rest of the Bible, for that matter. There's the spiritualizing method that we might call allegorization, if you will, allegorizing the Scriptures. And then there's, secondly, the literal method. Now, a quick test to find out which of these methods is being used is found in Revelation chapter number 20, where we read about the thousand years that Satan is cast into the bottomless pit and that Jesus sits on that throne for a thousand years. 
What does that thousand years mean? Is that a literal 1,000 years or is it something other than a thousand years? And so just by asking somebody that simple question, you can really get right down immediately to how it is they see not only the book of Revelation, but really the rest of the word of God for that matter. Do they spiritualize these matters? Do they spiritualize the word of God or do they take it at face value? Do they interpret these things literally? And I want you to know tonight that at Lighthouse Baptist Church, we reject the spiritualizing method, which means our interpreted our interpretive method is what, church? Literal. Our interpretive method will be literal as we study through the book of Revelation. Now, some will caricature the literal approach as though uh, taking a literal approach leaves no room for symbolism or figures of speech. I never have been able to figure that out. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's kind of a silly critique. For instance, when Satan is described as a great red dragon, the literal approach does not mean that, that Satan must, must therefore be a great red dragon. That's just plain silly. You with me? If I say that you look dog-tired, am I calling you a dog? If I say it's raining cats and dogs, are you going to go run and see if there are literal cats and dogs falling out of the sky? Probably not, right? It doesn't make any sense. So, a guy, so anyone who's taking a literal interpretation uh, of the Scripture is not saying that there isn't room for symbolism and room for metaphor and room for colorful language, if you will, that kind of language that really adds to, to our base language, to be able to say these things, to be able to say things like, you know, break a leg or, or the, 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 it's raining cats and dogs or to say that you look dog tired, to be able to say these kinds of things without it being taken wooden literally. However, here's what we do believe as literalists. We do believe that there's a literal meaning behind the figure of speech, that there's a literal meaning behind the metaphor, that something is being communicated by that, and that doesn't mean that you can take the metaphor and make it say whatever it is that you want it to say, wherever it is that your imagination can go, that's just plain foolishness. Amen? And so there is a literal meaning behind the metaphor. When I say that it's raining cats and dogs, I'm saying the fact that it, the rain is really coming down out there. It's raining hard outside. There's a literal meaning behind it. It doesn't mean that Cadillacs are crashing into Pontiacs. You're spiritualizing it or whatever. You follow what I'm saying? And so there's a literal meaning behind the fact that Satan is a red dragon. Hold that thought. We'll get to it eventually. It's only a couple of chapters down the road here. So a literal approach does leave room for symbolism and leave room for metaphor. Common everyday language is used literally. And common everyday language is meant to be taken literally, even when picturesque language is used. And that is the way that God created language and that is the way that God uses language. Therefore, that is the way that we should interpret God's language. Is, is that that difficult? Additionally, a literal interpretation of, Re of Revelation places la a large portion of the book itself into the future. And so we should understand that right at the beginning of our study. When we take a literal approach to the book of Revelation, we find that much of it is still future to our time. In fact, everything from chapter 4 to the end of the book, with a brief exception of some things in chapter 12, describes events still in the future. The literal view also leads to the conclusion that Christ's physical return to the earth will occur just prior to the thousand-year reign of Christ found in Revelation 20. So just think two things right up front. A literal interpretation is going to lead us to the place where a good portion of the book itself is still future for us from our perspective, from where we are in the church age right now. 
You say, well, where are we found in the book of Revelation? Chapters 2 and 3. Okay? And we'll get to that as well. But then also, a literal interpretation will lead to the idea that Jesus is going to return just prior to that thousand-year reign of Christ that we find in the book of Revelation. This is known as the premillennial return of Christ. All this and so much more will be clarified for us as we study this grand book. The first three verses, however, are an introduction to the whole and answers for us four questions. So we're going to ask those four questions and answer them real briefly tonight. Number one, who owns this book of Revelation? Well, it is given to Jesus Christ, and therefore, Jesus is the owner. Christ is the owner. So look at, again at verse number one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. So if I give you this Bible, the, this Bible now belongs to you, right? And so the revelation itself belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was given to him. He is the owner. However, not only is Christ the owner of the book, the book is also a revelation of Christ. And so look again at the first five words there in the book itself. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole of the Christian life centers around the Lord Jesus Christ, including our hope for the future and our understanding of that future as well. It all centers around Christ. We have a hope for the future because of Christ. And all that we understand about the future is because of Jesus Christ and our relationship to him. The whole of our life centers around Jesus Christ. Consequently, this book of the Revelation centers around Christ and highly exalts him. In chapter 1, he is the Alpha and the Omega. In chapters 2 and 3, he is the head of the church. In chapter 4, he is God on his throne. In chapter 5, he is the Lamb and he is worthy. In chapter 6 through 18, he is the eternal God whose eternal counsel is not subject to the power of men or the power of angels. In chapter 19, he's the triumphant King of glory. In chapter 20, he is the judge of all creation. In chapters 21 and 22, he is the bridegroom reigning for all eternity with his bride. It is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It is about him and him alone. And your life is about Jesus Christ and about him and him alone. Someone say, the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The second question that is answered in the introduction is this, who gave the book of the revelation? Well, we've already seen that. God the Father gave it to Jesus Christ. So God the Father gave it to our Lord. And so again, in, in verse 1, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. God the Father gave to the Son to show unto him and uh, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And so the Father gave it to the Son. Now in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, we read this, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Man had not been created yet, and God is saying, let us make man in our image. This verse reveals some interplay within the Godhead. Not that God is speaking to himself, but that God is speaking within himself. You with me? Not that God is speaking to himself, but that God is speaking within himself. And we have just read that God the Father gave this revelation to God the Son. Once again, we see that interplay in the Godhead. It's not God speaking to himself, but God speaking within himself. Now, why did he do it? So that, it, so that the word itself, the revelation itself, might be made known. That's what it says again here in verse number one. Look one more time there. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which the Father gave unto him. Why did the Father give it to him? Why did God give it to him? to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And so to show these things, to show the revelation, to make it known unto his servants. In fact, God has always revealed himself and his word through his son who is the word. You with me? And so God has a word to be revealed to his servants, and so he gives it to the word. 
He gives his word to Jesus, who is the word, to reveal it unto man, and that's the way that God has always done it. For instance, when we read in Genesis 1, the words, and God said, let there be, God said, let there be, that spoken word of God in the beginning came from the living word of God. How do we know that? Because in, in John it says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with, with God and the word was God. All things were made by him. In the beginning was the word and all things were made by him and without him, without the word was not anything made that was made. Without him, without the word of God was not anything made that was made. When God said The Word, when the Word spoke, when Jesus spoke. And so God had a creation, He had a Word, He had a revelation, He gave it to the Word, and the Word carried it through. You with me? So God has always revealed Himself through the Word. In creation, God reveals Himself with His Word, which is Jesus Christ. In coming into the world, God came as the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of uh, of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and of truth. The Word was made flesh. In salvation, God reveals Himself through His Word as well. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We hear about God from the Word of God, who is the Word of God, that comes from God, revealed by God through His Son, who is the Word. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. In the written word, God reveals himself as the word, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints of the marrow, and is discerned of the thoughts and, and, and the intents of the heart. The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart because it is the word of God from God, given to God for us through God, through the word. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, that is how God has always revealed himself to us. Even, again, in his incarnation, we read this, For for in him, in Christ Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of who God is, is in his word, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father has given to his Son the revelation of himself to the world. Why would the book of Revelation be any different? Amen? Third question. Who received the book of the Revelation? We'll look at the verse again, verse number one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, uh, which God gave unto him. So Jesus receives it first, but it doesn't stop there. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent, and so the word was sent again, and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And so the apostle John received the revelation. Now the word signified in this verse is significant. It means to make known by giving a sign or signs, and there are indeed many signs or signs in the book of Revelation. And so to be signified, he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. In other words, he gave signs to to help us to understand the revelation, symbols of the book of, of the book of Revelation. And by the way, it is these signs, the signification, the things that were given unto us through these signs, that is the reason why, or one of the reasons why, the word is so captivating and intimidating. Revelation is a very captivating book, but it's also very intimidating. Because you, try to re- remember the very first time that you read Revelation without any context at all, and you walk away from it going, your head's spinning. It's captivating. It's kind of a, really exciting. And yet, at the same time, it's intimidating. What in the world is God trying to say? What is going on in the pages of this book? But who is this angel that was sent to signify these things to John? Who is this person? He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Who is this angel? We cannot say for certain who the angel is. However, it does seem as though the angel is mentioned again at the end of the book of Revelation. Go real quickly to Revelation 22, if you would, please. Revelation 22. 
And I want you to look at verse number eight when you get there. If you've got the right kind of Bible, it should be the very last chapter in your Bible. Amen. Mm. And look at verse number eight. The Bible says, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I'd heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Going all the way back to chapter one, there was an angel sent to signify these things. Then said he unto me, See thou do it not. For I, this angel that was sent unto you, I am thy fellow servant. Excuse me? Well, that's interesting. And of thy brethren, the prophets. It's as though this angel is a messenger who is actually a human, not a messenger who is an angelic being. And of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he that walketh filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Still. Now, again, we can't say for certain who this is, who this is but I don't know about you, it's very reminiscent to me of what we find in Daniel. Turn back to Daniel real quickly, Daniel chapter number 12. And we just wrapped up this study, so hopefully it's somewhat fresh in your mind. Daniel chapter number 12, and look with me again, if you would please, at verse number 4 there. The Bible says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Now, in Revelation, we learn that the time is at hand, but here in the book of Daniel, the time is not at hand, so he's supposed to seal up the book. But in Revelation, John is told not to seal the book because the time is at hand. So that's interesting. We find this issue of being sealed Look down at verse number 9. He said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up or sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall, shall understand, but the wise shall, shall understand. So we have the, the purified and we have the unpurified. The purified will be made white and the wicked will be wicked still. Almost as though what we read again in, in Revelation about the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, this doesn't really prove anything per se, but I find it very interesting. Could this angel, this human, this prophet be Daniel? Because Daniel was a prophet, right? And he is in heaven where John went to receive this revelation in chapter number four. He was caught up into heaven. And that's certainly where Daniel is with God in heaven at that time. He was told, Daniel was told to seal his book, whereas John was told not to seal his book. And both talk about the righteous and the unrighteous. Both are mentioned. So it's interesting to speculate, but we can't know for sure. So turn back with me to Revelation now that we've proved that this is Daniel. Good, you're listening. So once again, we can't know for sure, but it's kind of an interesting study, and I think it's good for us to study the Word of God. Amen? I think it's good for us to compare Scripture with Scripture. So it's interesting, again, speculation, but we can't know for sure. What we do know is that this angel is sent to signify the revelation, to make it known by giving signs. And in verse 2, we see a clarification of the work that John is, is to do because he's received this book of the Revelation. And so look at verse number 2. So... It is signified by his angel unto the servant John, to whom it is given, is given to John, who, so that pronoun who is referring to John. So John bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And so first of all, John bear record. These are not John's words. Turn real quickly, if you would please, to 2 Peter chapter number 1. Should just be a few pages to the left in your Bible. Second Peter chapter number 1. And look at verse number 20 when you get there. The Bible says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is in, of, of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so John is saying, look, 
I, I didn't receive this by any private interpretation. God didn't show me something and then I interpreted it for you. God gave it to me and I gave it to you exactly as God gave it to me. Amen? And so I was, if John was moved by the Holy Spirit of God. These are not John's words. He just simply bear record of what it was that he was shown, what God made known to him. And then also it says that, he, uh, uh, that, that John bear testimony. He bear record and he bear testimony of Jesus Christ. Turn with me over to 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1. Again, right close to where you already are. 1 John chapter number 1. And look at verses number, verses number 1 through 3. The Bible says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, so John was there, which we have seen with our eyes, John saw with his own eyes, which we have looked upon, John looked upon, and, ha and our hands have handled of the word of life. He, he has seen and handled Jesus Christ, for the life was manifested that we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And so John is indeed bearing record of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereof he, he knew whereof he spoke because he knows Jesus Christ. He is qualified to testify to this revelation of Jesus Christ. So we turn back to Revelation chapter 1 again. Number 1, John bear record of the Word of God, and he, and, and he bear record of the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is indeed the Jesus Christ that I know, that I've handled, and that I've seen. And we're going to see a revelation of Christ here in chapter 1 later in our study. And then he says, He bear record of all things and testimony of all things that he saw. And once again, the idea here is that he didn't leave anything out. It's not of private interpretation. When God gives his word to those that write these things down, they write down exactly what it is that God gave them to write. It's his inspiration, not their inspiration. It's his inspiration, not their interpretation. We don't, the, the word of God that you have in your hand is not the private interpretation of men. That's why this is not the word of man. It is the word of God. Amen? And John wrote it faithfully, the things that he was given, so that even those things that God said not to write, he didn't speculate about. Turn to chapter 10 real quickly. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Chapter number 10 of Revelation in verse number 4, the Bible says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, so he hears these seven thunders from heaven, and he hears what it is that they utter, the things that they say. And so he says, I was about to write the things again that they had uttered, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And so if God said, don't write them. He didn't write them. He wrote exactly what it was that God gave him to write. And so he bare testimony of all these things. Then lastly, the last question we want to ask and answer as we turn back now to Revelation chapter 1 is who needs this book of the Revelation? Who needs this book of the Revelation? Look again at verse number 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants which th things, things which must shortly come to pass. To show unto his servants. Who needs this revelation? All of us who are his servants do. If you're his servant, you need this book. In other words, we all do. We all need this book, and so it was given to all of us. Verse 3 elaborates on our reception of this book, which reveals that there is a blessing waiting for those who will receive and read these words. In other words, God wants everyone to read and be blessed by this book. Did you catch that? This book is for his servants. If you're his servant, this book is for you. And God wants you to be blessed by this book. How do I know that? Look at verse number three. Blessed is he, that servant of God, blessed is he that readeth, and they, those servants, that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. 
Blessed is he. God wants everyone to read and be blessed by this book. Now, this speaks volumes against the Roman Catholic doctrine that the average person should not read the Scriptures. With such nonsense, they exclude God's people from the blessings that he wants them to have. You can't have that blessing because you shouldn't be reading that book. It's a bunch of nonsense. Now, the blessing... And by the way, when I think of blessing, I think about the the smile of God upon you, that God is happy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When God is happy, well, then things are going good. Amen? And so the smile of God, when, when you are blessed, the smile of God is upon you. The smile of God is on those who, number one, read. That read, blessed is he that readeth this book, this revelation. The best study is private study. The best study is private study. It is there that God can speak to you personally. And so I'm asking you right here at the beginning of our study of Revelation, will you read the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you take some time out of your busy schedule, open the Word of God in the privacy of your own home, in your own closet, so to speak, open the Word of God and read it and let God bless you because of it? Will you read the Word of God? The Bible doesn't say, well, maybe I'll bless you if you read it. He says, no, I want to give you a blessing. Blessed are those that will read it. Will you read the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ? Secondly, he says, blessed are those that hear. Not one of us has arrived. We are all still growing. And we are all still learning. And I am growing, and I am learning, and you are as well. And therefore, we need to hear what others say about God's Word so that maybe we don't go astray ourselves. And that is why God gave to us the church. There's a reason why we come and hear the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. The very best study is private study. You ought to involve yourself in private study every day of your life. Spend some time in the Word of God. And I'm challenging you to open the book of Revelation and spend some time in it. Amen. And then don't neglect the assembling of yourself together, such as the manner of some, because you need the church of God. You need the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. You need to know what God is saying also through the church to you so that you don't go astray either. Amen? And so we need each other. So God gave the church to hear the Word of God, and hearing should drive us back to the Word of God and back to our own personal study again. So you take some time, and you read the Word of God. You let God speak to you through it. Then you come to the house of God, and you hear what God says through the messenger of God and and through the people of God. And then you take that, and you run back with it, and you go study some more. In other words, what you've heard, you don't even have to take it at face value. You can run back and you can search the Scriptures and see whether these things be so. By the way, isn't that exactly what the Bereans did? The Bible says these, the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Read the Word of God and then hear the Word of God and let that drive you back into more study of the Word of God and grow for crying out loud let's grow together amen will you hear and then study some more thirdly blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and what's that next word church keep those things which are written therein the thirdly is to keep look We must continue reading and hearing and studying and learning, but not merely for the glory of knowing, because that kind of knowledge puffeth up, the Bible says. If you read the Word of God and spend some time in it, not only are you going to find wisdom from the Word of God, But you're going to find things that are going to cause you to have to stop and think a little bit. Amen? Because God is constantly telling you to get wisdom, to get wisdom, to learn, to grow. Wisdom is the principal thing. So get wisdom with all thy getting, get understanding, right? To grow in the knowledge and the understanding of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To grow, to grow, to grow! And then God says, knowledge puffeth up. 
Now, isn't that interesting? Because the idea is not to gain God knowledge for knowledge's sake. The idea is to gain knowledge to know God better, to love God more, and to love people more. It's to be used of God better. Not so that you can say, mm, yeah, I know that. You understand? See, we must, we must continue reading. We must continue hearing. We must continue studying and learning, but not so that we can get puffed up. We are foolish to gain knowledge of the Word of God and then do nothing with it. The Bible says to be a doer of the Word. That's the reason why you're supposed to learn. That's the reason why you're supposed to grow, because it's supposed to change you, to be conformed to the image of Christ, to know God better and to love God more. And so we're supposed to be a, a doer of God's Word and not a hearer only. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass, beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed. To be blessed. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words and keep it. In other words, that do these things, that apply them to their lives, that look for a way in which you can take these truths and apply them. And so I'm asking you here at the beginning of our study, will you purpose in your heart to keep God's word? Not just know it, not just grow in it, but begin to apply it to your life, to keep these things in your life. We need this book of Revelation. And by the way, we need it now because the Bible says the time is at hand. Look there at the end of verse number three. Four, here's the reason why you need it so badly. The time is at hand. At hand means that the time is both immediate and imminent. Immediate in the sense that the message is to the churches for our blessing in the here and now. Right here and right now, you can be blessed by these things. But it's really up to you. And so it's immediate, but it's also imminent. Imminent means overhanging, means ready to happen at any moment, at any time. Nothing stands in the way for the literal unfolding of the events of Revelation in the world today, except for God's hand, except for God's staying hand. So all of this in the book of Revelation is immediate and imminent. We need to know it because it is at hand right now. You need to know these things. So let's wrap this up. We need the whole of the revelation of God, and we certainly need the book of the revelation of God. We should not shy from the revelation because some things in it are difficult. And by the way, some things in it are difficult. We okay? But we shouldn't shy from it. There's a blessing promised to those who will study this book. But that promise fails if we're not committed to keeping the words of this book. Are you committed, are you purposed to know and to do the will of God? Until you are, you'll miss the blessing. See, the blessing begins with reading, continues with hearing, but stops short and never quite gets there without the keeping. Why not make that commitment right here tonight at the beginning of our study to commit yourself to read the Revelation to hear the revelation, to study the revelation, and to keep it for his honor, for his glory, and not yours. Let's pray. Yeah.